All right, welcome back. Charles, where are we now? Are we, is this light the fuse? Is this light the wick? Where are we? We're lighting the wick this week. Okay, cool. Get it together. Cool. Oh, thank God. Yeah, we're back with Mark Stockinger part two. And this is a great conversation. Obviously, we had a lot of fun with him last week. This week, we get into John Wick and Jack Reacher and all sorts of stuff. It's um, it's really fun. He talks a little bit about Cruella, the new Cruella DeVille movie. And, um, you know, like some of our guests, he refuses to rank either John Wick or Mission Impossible movies. But <laughs> you should still listen. Don't hold it against him. I, we, we try. Understand. We always try. Yeah. But it's a, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, Charles, do you have anything to say or should I just go into my... I mean, I think maybe it's time for you just to go right into your favorite part. Just do it. Okay. Just go right into it. I want it. All right. This episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon, and you should definitely check out his podcast, My Favorite Album. You know, Charles, I was just thinking the other night, the last time we hung out with Jeremy, we had, uh, we had soup. You and I had soup. He had an actual meal <laughs> at a restaurant inside. No one was wearing masks. That was a long time ago. It was a wonderful moment, and we can't wait to get back to having soup with Jeremy. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, he's the best. But you I guess we could do like a Zoom soup. Who's going to hold him to eating soup, eating the soup, though? Like, we, have to, we, all, we all have to agree that we're going to eat the soup and then do it at the same time. So do we all have to make the same soup and then share it over Zoom in a way? Like, use the same recipe? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. We should okay. do that. All right, I'm going to text him when we get off this call. Um, <laughs> this episode is also brought to you by John B. And Real Estate Interest LLC, a possibly fictitious real estate advice company that for growing companies. And what they want you to know, if they are in fact real, is that companies can consult with them even if they're not looking to buy or sell. They help companies save and strategize to asterisk if they exist. I mean, they do exist. They're there. We know it's a real company. Right. They do business. They will help you. But the only question is, if you go there, is there, you know, a book in the bookshelf that if you pull open, the bookshelf then opens up and you go into the back or, you know, you go, maybe it's like the Virginia Department of Transportation and MI3 and it's an underground thing. You go underground mm. down the elevators and then you're then you're down and, and that's where the IMF is underneath. That's the real question. Because it's not it's a real <laughs> business. Right. But it could be a front. <laughs> Okay, got it. Charles, well, this is a can of worms we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of. But yeah. let's let people listen to this episode, and we'll be back afterwards. Before John Wick, you worked on a movie by some guy named Christopher McQuarrie called Jack Reacher. How was he? We're big fans of his, um, obviously. I gotta say, I'm a big fan of his too. Um, that's the only Chris McQuarrie film I worked on. He's also somebody who's very, very specific. Um, he actually orchestrated the film very specifically where it's gonna be music, where it's all gonna be sound. And I think that worked to everybody's benefit. Yeah. He, you know, is really knowledgeable about the sound of firearms and guns. And so that was beneficial to us. You know, he, and it was very big about screen geography and what you hear and how it tells the story for what you see. You know, the, the sound at the very beginning when the sniper takes his shots and basically sets up the story, he really wanted it to feel hyper reality and realistic, particularly in how it just you know, the shot, the report would reverb and echo and, you know, fill the space. You know, he was also, it gave us the opportunity because like there's a signature sound of cars going over the bridge that we could hear in a flashback. So, you know, develop certain sounds that are always going to be a uh, call and response to certain, not call and response, but something you can always refer to as, oh, I know where we are because I've heard that before. And when I've heard that before, I know where, where that location is. Right. Or at the end in the uh, the quarry, since you like stories about sound recording, we'll get to the guns in a little bit, but there's the Mercedes that um, that she drives, that Tom you know, uses the backup camera to get into the quarry where that fight happens. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a Mercedes pre-production car. It was a car that was not um, legal to have in the uh, US. So they had shipped a couple over from Germany, they'd done the shoot, they'd finished shooting the movie. I wanted to go out and record it. 
so anyway, in Jack Reacher, uh, there was the white Mercedes that Tom uses essentially use the backup camera to get into the quarry so he can have, so he can rescue. And in the process of, you know, putting the scene together, it's like, okay, I really want to record the car. It was a pre-production Mercedes that it was not legal in, in the U.S. But because Paramount controlled all that and Mercedes has their own PR folks, they like let us go out and take it out and record it. And we always go out to a place out in the desert to do that. And I asked the guys at Mercedes, I said, you know, you guys said you're gonna crush this when it's done. So can I do things to it? He goes, you can do anything you want. We just need all the pieces for the customs when we send it back. I said, like anything? It's like, have you guys seen the film? He goes, what do you wanna do? Like shoot the car? I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> so he's like, uh, um, okay. Well, like I said, if all the pieces come back. So we went out and we recorded the car for the engine and all the other things that we need. And at the end, well, we ran out of time to shoot it. But what we did is where we were recording, they had all these like metal poles. So we essentially about three or four miles an hour just rolling it, crushed it, crushed it to death. There wasn't a single panel. We broke all the windows, put, you know, 5.1 <laughs> microphones inside rammed it into other cars and not by driving it fast just rolling it doesn't take much to destroy a modern car ripped interior panels out of it all for sounds that were great to have in the film and uh you know the the, the team's two drivers took it back and i remember about a week later fortunately i didn't answer the call but i got a call from the people we caught it from it was like what the fuck did you do to our and they were just raged for a long time because <laughs> they thought they were going to get a little bit of damage or maybe a bullet hole here and there but we essentially totaled and wrecked the car in the name of sound. <laughs> it was fabulous, it was some of the most fun. And then, you know, I told a couple of my work colleagues about this and like, oh my God, Mercedes is so pissed. I hope I, uh, hope I don't really cause a huge problem for Paramount. But a week later, somebody took the crushed Mercedes emblem they must have got and put it on my door to my studio. <laughs> it's just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so. <laughs> and interestingly enough, maybe it was a pre-production car, then the glass, tempered glass is different in Germany, but smashing the glass, we all got little cuts from it. It was crazy. Oh, wow. You bleed for your work, Mark, and that's what we love. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's get into it here. We're, we're now on, on Light the Wick. We are fully involved in the John Wick franchise, and you, sir, are like a, a touchstone of this series. You've been through all three. How did you initially get involved, and did you ever think that you would still be doing these movies now? Um, I didn't think I would be doing these movies now, but I got involved because the post-production supervisor on the first and subsequently all three films is a friend of mine, and it was a film of challenge budget. And he was also the post-supervisor on Fury. I don't know if you know Fury. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge history fan, World War II fan, I'm like, oh man, I gotta work on this film. Well, that wasn't gonna happen. But he said, I'm, I'm post-supervising this other smaller film, which you might be interested in, and like you to meet the filmmakers. I did. It was their directorial debut. And we got along well. And that was my initiation into the John Wick series. So friend of a friend do you think how can i make this bullet hole or this gunshot sound differently the 900th time <laughs> you know what it is it's like a lot of things like if when you learn more and you want to try different things that you do that in the evolution of the series you know what might have been simple or in wick one became not complicated, but more articulate in two and subsequently in three. When you're talking about guns anyway, like what kind of compression do you use? What sort of other EQ or, you know, maybe helper plugins you use to accentuate certain aspects? Because every gunshot's probably got about seven or eight sounds to it. So most of that is so you can make them all the same person's gun sound different in different situations and different angles. So it doesn't sound like it's a bad loop and you need that variety and those choices to be able to do that. So that's how the guns have evolved. You know, it went from maybe a couple sounds, you know, something playing a low frequency and something playing a high frequency to something always playing the mechanism to the bullet eject to a couple different, maybe um, not too much mid range because a lot of times that's music but you know, higher or lower frequency sounds. Or now we discovered, oh, we need more of sort of like a 
high frequency snap to it, but it can't be too much and overwhelm the sound. So we've got to find some kind of cool compressor that'll help us with that. So that's how the guns in a series like Wick or any movie really evolve. You know, you learn things along the way and you just make it better. What about the different like wounds? Like, is there like brain brain splatter and uh, an <laughs> arterial spray and like things like that? Yeah. Oh man, no, there's, all that, there's, all the that, there's all that stuff. Well, you know, yeah. in a movie that's famous for his headshots, you got to have a headshot. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you kind of use the standard stereotypical sound guy stuff to put in there for that. But in three, when things got particularly messy with the shotguns, we <laughs> had some that the director, who's a huge fan, Chad Sahelski, the director of that, huge fan of, said, you guys, you're over the top. You got to take that down or take that out. <laughs> so we go through the film and kind of like pare down that a little bit. In other words, we found out what is too much. You always need to find out what is too much. I'm shocked that there's a ceiling on the John Wick uh, sound department, but I'm glad that you found it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when somebody wants to do that, you want to be able to press the envelope. You want to know what's not far enough and too far, you know? Well, like, what is it? Like, are you using like watermelons or something? Or what is it? What was too much? <laughs> it was the duration of the sound. You know, like okay. when somebody would shoot visually, you would see the blood spray and splatter and all that. And so you might articulate that with a sound that goes as long as the visual. But sometimes that means that it's just the sound goes on too long or it's too noticeable or it's too apparent. You know, you want it to be sort of inherent. Not that it always is, but you don't want to make everything a little bit too extreme because then you have no place to go. And you always want to have a right. place to go. So. I like that Charles is imagining that Gallagher comes in and just smashes a bunch <laughs> of watermelons in the studio. Well, you get to the point where you could smash a lot of well at watermelons and still not get the sound you're after. <laughs> that's the thing that's crazy. Well, you know, there's sounds like um, somebody, I don't know who recorded it, but somebody took a pig carcass and smashed the skull with a metal pole. And those are some of the most intense bullet hits ever. Oh my God. I think that guy needs to be arrested. But Well, I think the story that goes with that is, and I wasn't there, so I can't speak to it. So I'm going to go by, you know, Hollywood, um, Hollywood rumors, but somebody got a, you know, with the former John, got a pig carcass, took it to the Foley stage to record all this sort of stuff. Because we do that. We'll grab things, hopefully not dead things, but whatever, and take it to the Foley stage and record it just because it's a quiet environment. It's really controllable. And when they were finished doing what they did, they went back out to the alley to put it, basically in the trunk of their car to bring it back to Farmer John. And as they were doing that, some cop rolled down the alley and here's some guy covered with blood <laughs> trying to explain his way. Like, wow. <laughs> so anyway, wow. Like that happens all too often. It's part of the gorilla <laughs> recording I was talking about, even though that might not have been gorilla, it still was uh, an extreme recording experience. And that's just a, a story that, that that headshot sound is one that's been just used by different companies for years and years. Like that wasn't for John Wick. That was just for something else. And that sound just gets passed on. Is that what happens? Well, there is really no such thing as the headshot sound. It's just what do you want right. it to sound like and what do you need to get there? So do you, you need something that's fairly sharp because it's usually only frames away from the gunshot. So it's easily overwhelmed. And if it's a low frequency sound, you'll never hear it. And you do want to have something that's got some duration to the sound, or again, you'll never hear it. And if you want to have that be part of the, the collage of the sound, you're going to have to pick and choose frequencies that you're going to actually hear. So right. it has to be kind of crafted in each situation. Yeah, it might be similar. Like a lot of times, if you're, like I said, with the guns, there might be five or six different sounds, seven, I don't know, depending on where it is inside, outside. Um, even with headshots and punches and the rest, there might be quite a few different sounds in your palette and you go through and pick and choose which combinations of those you need for a particular event. And headshots are no different. What about Keanu cutting off his finger? Was that a celery stick or something? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was actually a carrot chop. Or, I mean, that was a major component in there because, you know, a carrot chop on a board yeah. and then you've got like carrot chop it didn't have a crunch to it because you know crunches are usually long in duration that had to be quick right right so it was some carrot breaks and it was just some um like you know like a like that stereotypical axe sound that goes into wood it not only has a big funk but it has yeah. a little bit of a ring off to it and you know a couple different versions of that cumulative from what i remember anyway was the finger off brilliant work brilliant work 
hey, playing with sound. That's what yeah. this is all about, really. Well, Charles and I are obsessed with like the first like 30 minutes of John Wick 3 is just fucking crazy. But you have motorcycles, you have horses, you have all this stuff. Was there something that really was challenging for you or something that was tough to crack? Well, um, I think the overall challenge in John, all the John Wick movies, and I think particularly in three, is that the director is a huge fan of sound effects. He really wants to hear that as part of the visceral experience he's trying to create, you know? So he likes all the stuff that you ultimately hear in the movie, but there's a lot of it. And there's a lot of it in close proximity. And frequently there's, not always, but frequently there's a score too. So you're just fighting frequencies. You're fighting for sonic space because you only have so much. So it's how to carve. Like if you were to listen to the soundtrack, well, even before it gets mixed, but particularly after it gets mixed, everything will sound cut off. Things that maybe don't sound cut off in the movie sound very cut off and truncated. And that's the way you can make things more specific and you keep it from being just a wall of noise and you make, uh, just al allows you to sort of cut and hear the other sound. Like, you know, the old film days, the stereotype was if you had a gun that went bang, 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 well, between every shot, you put a blank frame of something, blank frame of fill leader. And of course now digital, you cut it off and have no audio. And that helps gives the excursion wave for the next sound clarity. And so there's a lot of that concept going on in all movies, but a film like John Wick in particular. So you can hear it all. Otherwise, the first shot would, or hit, or you name it, whatever the thing is, would just overwhelm the rest and you wouldn't get that staccato clean sound anymore. So I'm not gonna say it's a trick because I think everybody does it that way. Um, but nonetheless, that's some of the things you've got to do to get your sound to play. You know, if you think about it in the terms of sound effects, okay, here's what I want it to be. What does it take to get there? And a lot of times it's, it's rougher than meets the eye. That's probably the best way to explain it. Did you get to meet any of the dogs? No. <laughs> well, I hear that those dogs, you've got to be careful that you're not wearing visual effects green because that's what they are trained to attack. Because I'm seeing, I'm seeing that before wow. the visual effects were completed, those Belgian mar starts with an M, where that's what they're trained to do, is attack that color. And so the stunt people on the set, like if it's gonna grab you in the arm or the crotch, that's the color that they would attack. And so when they finish shooting the scenes, there's like a special home for dogs that can't be retrained where they all hang out. And hopefully in that case, nobody ever shows up wearing that color green or you're in trouble. <laughs> You know, the dogs, a lot of um, wolf sounds and, you know, things like that. Yeah, I was going to ask about the dog sounds because we, we talk often about dogs in movies on this podcast. And I was wondering about, like, you know, the puppy at the, in the first movie and then the dogs in the third one or, or John Wick's dog in the second one. Were you br bringing in certain dogs to do sounds or were you just kind of pulling from a library? In that case, we, we for both those films, we pulled from a library. We were going to actually... I was in contact with the Game of Thrones wolf wrangler guy at one point mm. to record, but didn't really need to. When you, I mean, the way I look at recording, I always want to do it when you can. It would never pass up an opportunity. But if you have something that's working, you don't necessarily replace it unless you have to, you know? Right. Um, and in that case, we had material that worked, you know, spent a lot of time on like jaw snaps and things like that, which were manufactured for when they bite. You know, again, a hidden sound that just helps the moment. A lot of those, a lot of those dogs in there, they're, they're different dogs. Um, it's interesting, sometimes in real life, a big dog, in the recording of it doesn't have a big bark. I mean, it might sound big in person, but, you know, it doesn't have that, like that chesty, low frequency woof that you want to have. So sometimes I'm trying to think we slow things down. It, we got a combination that has some German Shepherds in it. It had had a pit bull, I think a little bit. And there's this other dog, I don't know what kind of, just like called like, you know, Bambi in the library. I don't know what it really is, but you know, <laughs> basically it had a mean menacing bark, you know, that was the name of the dog that somebody recorded way back when. Yeah. So you just kind of find what you need and go record it if you don't have it. So, but that was that simple for those dogs. You know, um, there were definitely wolf sounds in there. I have recorded wolves for, um, 
uh, day after tomorrow. That was an interesting experience. Yeah, they were their um, their presence was worse than their sound. <laughs> they spooked you. No, they were, we were going to do it on an ADR stage because, you know, again, we want a controlled environment and hired all the wolf wranglers and they all come in and two wolves, their, their leashes are chains. Let's put it that way. If they're chains, you know, they're pretty serious. And these things look like you want them to look like. They were just mean as fuck. So you get them on the ADR stage and um, they put out some food. And I guess what you do is you keep it from eating its food. But we couldn't have the chain sound because that would ruin the sound of the wolves. And so they just kind of let it let the wolves go, they not only didn't eat their food, they didn't make a single sound. They had stage fright. It's like the wolves had stage fright. So <laughs> we got some things, but at the end of the day, it was like, okay, we gotta take them back to, you know, their the ranch where they keep the, the animals. Wow. So no, I guess that's, to me, that's an example of, you don't always get the obvious. The obvious right. was you're going to get wolves that sound like what you hear wolves in movies and they're going to be vicious and they're going to like rip your head off literally. And it's going to sound that way. But at the end of the day, nope. Uh-uh. You've now worked with Chad and David together and on their own. And have they sort of evolved as filmmakers since that first John Wick? Oh, very much so. You know, they had a lot of experience as um, second unit directors, stunt coordinators before that. And, you know, I'm sure on various films, even as second unit directors, they got first, first unit material that they were going to shoot. So they have that. And, but interestingly enough, they're both so smart and such great storytellers that having the opportunity, they were just, they're able to even hone their tastes and their skills. So yes, they've evolved, but they started off in a great place, you know? <laughs> Yeah. They're all, they're both very self-deprecating when it comes to things like, oh, well, if the director only had more experience, we would have done it that way. So it looks great to me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and because of that background, they're very relatable to all of us that do the work and appreciative in a way to be a good collaborator and leader in the process, which is really cool. That's great. We've, we've talked to Chad. We haven't talked to David. Hopefully we will talk to him before this. Oh, that's great. Merry go round is done. But yeah, he's, he seems great. Interesting, isn't he? Yeah, he was yeah. great. He's got so many interesting things to say and takes and, and motivations for why he's doing things a certain way that relate to everything from Greek mythology to all sorts of different films and genres. I remember I did a thing at USC with him once. And now, hey, he's Chad. He's, he's, he's the director and he's got a big personality. And just listening to him speak, I was like in awe. And of all the times I've been with him, I'd never, I've heard him say a lot, but not some of the things he said in that venue as how it relates to his ideas, where they come from, where they gestate from, and maybe what he's going for or what parallels he's trying to run. And I'm like, wow, you know, I always knew he was a brilliant guy, but put all that together, it's just, you know, and, and Dave is the same way. I mean, they are film buffs, affectionados, and, um, you know, David will relate to, you know, other films that were really great at making something work, maybe not so great. And how, you know, this film is an homage to that, but is playing counterpoint to this. And this feels like going to film school every day, you know, working with them, which is how it really should be. Because you always, you, you want your leaders to be really inspirational and, and with their ideas, what they do. and But be collaborative too. You know, they're both extremely collaborative. Which is great because, again, they're really smart and um, they know all too well they'd probably limit their creative choices if they were to limit the people that contribute to those choices. And so they can say, yes, no, great, not so great, not for this movie, more of that, you know, so on and so forth down the line. Well, Charles, I think you and I should have a free question to ask about one sound that Mark (laughs) has done in the past from his, his amazing filmography. Before we close up, do you have you have yours yet? I think I know what yours is going to be, but I'll, I'll ask mine first, which is... Well, now you got to be curious what, what you have in mind for me. Uh, I'm, well, <laughs> I, I want to ask about the Spock dialogue in Star Trek when it's all, like, garbled and crazy when they're in that ice planet. Do you remember that and where that came from? Totally remember. Um, I'm trying to think. When he's telling uh, Kirk about you know what happened with eric bana and the planet and all of that um 
Well, I wasted my question. Uh, no, you didn't waste your question. Okay. I think, <laughs> well, when you get to something like that is you need to kind of source that from a lot of different sources. So it, it's unique and it doesn't sound the same. I'm trying to think of a better way to explain that. Sometimes if you go like, oh, I'm just going to take voices and reverse them and speed them up, then everything sounds sort of reversed and sped up. In yeah, it's got a great tempo to it, yeah. Um, a lot of times what you do is you just get snippets of different voices and you lay them out as an instrument on a, um, a sampler, sampler and you sequence them, you know, and you, you play it off that. There was some of that in there. There were some previous recordings that I don't even know what they came from, but they were sort of garbled a little bit on their own. There's this other thing where there's, um, I'll refer to it as numbers, but you get it through like a CB radio or a ham radio. And I don't know where it comes from. It's people just counting various numbers. It's almost like a code, but there's a lot of different voices and most of it comes across as being garbled. So that's also a source. That was a source for that as well. As a matter of fact, that's been a source for other languages of, of note. But we did have a translator for um, anything we wanted to say in any Star Trek language. So that's not your question, but. Before I throw it over to Charles, I have to ask you, do we hear the Cruella de Vil song in Cruella? You do. Okay. That's all I want to know. Oh, good. Speaking good. of dogs, if, when you want to talk about dogs, we can double back. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do a special episode. Oh, well, okay. Cruella. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to. Is that that's for the upcoming Emma Stone Corella movie? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, which is excellent. Uh, we, oh, cool. we cannot wait. Both Emmas are off the chart in that movie. Like, who is em, Emma Thompson? Is is she bad too? Yes, she's okay. the Baroness. She okay, plays the, she plays the Baroness. And it's got like an '80s punk aesthetic, right? Yeah, a little bit more '70s, but okay. it, yeah, well, late '70s, early '80s, kind of like punk aspect to it, with an amazing soundtrack. I hope that what's currently in the film is to stay in the film well that's coming next year we hope um but 2021 let is hope that we yes let's have in a theater again so i missed that we're i know not miss anything else that we're missing i know we're shriveling away charles uh i'm gonna let charles do his uh his his sound question and i want to see if i'm right about what he's gonna ask about I, I don't think, I don't know if, if you are. I, I mean, the, I'll tell, I mean, there's a movie I want to ask you about, which is just one of my absolute favorite movies, my, uh, Michael Mann's Heat, and what it was like to work with Michael Mann, because I've heard he's very specific about sound. He's very specific about sound. The only scene that I worked on in Heat really was the shootout in the city. Well, that's an uh, important terrible scene. Terrible scene, terrible scene to work on. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he supposedly, didn't they like actually shoot cars? Like they, they like actually got guns and went in a field and shot the exact cars and in, in, that they ended up using in that scene. And then they like use some kind of effect to pull that off or something. Like no, that. Well, I mean, I can't speak to that, but what I can speak to is what we did is um, uh, Lee Orloff, the production sound mixer had a session in downtown LA whenever they were maybe not shooting, but you, literally, but maybe on a Sunday or something like that, where they recorded the guns in those spaces. Right. So those guns were recorded outside of what happened as squibs in production. They were, you know, squibs specifically to create the reverb. Sounds of which I must say I still use today. Um, probably has been about wow. two weeks since I used it last. Cleaned up, of course, because, you know, they're all model recordings and there's quite the noise for it that goes with it because you got to really reach for the signal to get that sound. But a little bit to explain about that scene is, you know, dutifully you get that scene. It's like a great shootout in the street. And like most sound editors want to do is like, you want to make it really cool. And you've got all these great recordings of guns and you go in and you make this beautiful, hopefully beautifully crafted scene with all these different perspectives. We did that. And Michael Mann listens to it. And he's like, where are the guns we recorded? Well, they were in there, but they weren't the dominant sound. And what he wanted, which was perfect for the, the chaos of the movie and that scene, is it wasn't even so much about the shot as it was about the echo and the reverb and the fact that everything swam around. And that was really important to him. And um, at the end of the day, we, you know, the pendulum swung from being something that was a little bit more Hollywood to something that was almost purely based on production wild recordings to something that was a little bit of a hybrid in the middle. Right. Because remember how I said sometimes in guns, even though we know them as big boomy sounds, you need a little bit of a sharp sound to them or you need different frequencies to make them what you want. So there'd be other sounds in there in addition to his production sounds, which were the prominent sounds, but others just to 
choose to accentuate different shots. Oh, use a little bit more low frequency instead of trying to do it with EQ and messing up potentially the, uh, the original sound, you would add those frequencies with other sounds to it. But that was, that was my experience on heat. And I was right that you were going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah. Or I thought maybe he would ask about downsizing, but, um, oh, yeah. I did want to ask about what, yeah, what it was like working with Alexander Payne. He's a, a hero of mine, a uh, fellow Omaha born. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. He's the hero of mine and everybody who's crossed paths with him too. He's, he's great. He's another director who's really involved in the, um, in every aspect of the film. He truly loves the process and he loves the craft and he loves everybody's craft. So he has a lot to say about everything. Um, you know, in that film, he's trying to create a world, which maybe is how I came to it because I'd worked with that picture editor before doing that in other films with that person. So, you know, there was a lot of world to create in that movie, even though, I would say it's the first movie I've worked on that had a gazillion visual effects of which almost none required sound enhancement. It was all <laughs> visual, it was all backdrop, it was all scale, right? Everything that really had sound was practical in its own way, even though it was all made up. It was fun because we got to do an Atmos mix and when you're like in the, uh, the big container, which is really sort of the, the projects of, uh, of the downsized world that, you know, things could be over your head and around you and all that, which is something he's typically not into at all. You know, that's not the kind of films he makes, but in that he was creating a world and he wanted that world. So right. we were able to do something like that, which is nice. So that's, cool. that's the, my, that's my quick Alexander Payne story. Uh, we're about <laughs> to have one of the stars of one of the movies you worked on color of night. Uh, so I was also wondering, does, does Bruce Willis's penis have a sound? <laughs> uh, it, it's just you know it's penis and water haven't you recorded that before <laughs> not personally no <laughs> okay well that's good okay. um yeah oh my god it's funny it's color of night is marked more by that was right in the middle of that really bad earthquake in la uh northridge yeah yeah so yeah nonetheless um yeah, Color of Night, that was wild. Richard Rush, quite a guy. You should get the Blu-ray because there's a, a much better director's cut in there, which is interesting, which I'm sure you preferred as well. Yes. Okay. Usually I always prefer the director's cut. Yeah. They got a plan and that's their plan. <laughs> They're, it's not arbitrary that they call it the director's cut. Well, we, uh, we have some very important questions to ask you now, which is, there aren't as many movies, but I was wondering if you could rank uh, the John Wick movies uh, in your order of preference. No. Maybe. Okay. I think the fifth on I have to take the fifth on that because um, they're all enduring in their own way and they're all unique and um, I can't rank them. Although I'll have to say that there's something even more enduring about the third, just because the world of John Wick was expanded upon to levels you would never see coming. And I am such a fan of John Wick and the franchise and getting to work on him is amazing. And when you sort of peel back the layers of that onion, I love that every moment of it. We would have also accepted, I think four and five are going to be my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> well, they probably will. Yeah. yeah. We, we're, we, I just talked to Chad a couple days ago about four. So, so you got it. It's percolating. It's percolating. Okay. It's, and it's still percolating with him as well. But yeah, you know. he sounded like he knew where they were going to shoot which I think is one of the key components of these things is location. Yeah. The key components is location. They're going to yeah. have to pull some things off to pull, make all that happen. Yeah. Um, can you rank the Mission Impossible movies? Have you kept up with the series? Actually, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't just assume that you've watched all of them, but have you? Um, one, two, and three for sure. And the last one, I couldn't even tell you, is the last one five or six? Is six, right? Six, no, yeah. Five, six, six, yeah. Yeah. For a long time, my IMDb had me uh, working on seven and eight, which is pretty funny because that's not the case. But <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've seen one, two, three, and six. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, and six. I take that back. I can't, you know, again, I can't really rank them. I am really a proponent of loving the one you're with, and at the end of the day, it's like a guy with many wives. Um, love them all. Do you look at those <laughs> at the movies you didn't work on and go, nah, the timing wasn't right on that? Or do you have those kind of thoughts? Very rarely. Okay. I, mean, I, have, I always feel like I'm really impressed with what everybody does. Yeah. We, I think Charles and I have gotten a really 
deep appreciation of all aspects of sound design through this podcast. Cause I mean, you've seen who we talked to and you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a lot of catching up to do by the way. Yeah. Oh, that was your library of podcasts. I hope you, I hope you enjoy them, but Mark, thank you so much for, for chatting with us. Anytime you want to come back, please let us know. Cause we have probably a thousand more questions and we'll, we will, we will be in touch. I'm sure. All right. Bye. Right, we are back, Charles. You happy with that episode? I feel great. That was. I think Mark was so fun to talk to, and it was amazing to hear all his. He had so much, so many great stories. I love to hear the stuff about heat, the gun sounds from heat that he said he still uses to this day is so awesome. And then also, of course, hearing about Jack Reacher, it's always great to hear Christopher McCory stories. Right. So uh, that was cool to hear. And, uh, you know, it's, for me, I'm a big Alexander Payne fan. I was born in Omaha, like, like him, so it's fun to hear stories about him. And I don't think I've even told the story on this show before, but I've had a long history with Payne. He jokingly calls me his stalker. Uh, or maybe not so jokingly, I don't know. But, you know, when I was in college, I met him. He was, uh, it was at a test screening for About Schmidt, and he was so nice to me and had me and my friends come and visit the editing room. Uh, on a separate occasion just like he, i met him at the test screen and then he, he gave me his number and and my friends and i went there and sat on a couch while he was editing about schmidt and he gave us all chips ahoy cookies and was just the nicest guy and i've just seen him over the years over and over and so he he, he knows me and knows that i'm a crazy person who is uh stalking him uh have you talked to him recently charles no i haven't i last time i saw him was at a a night owl screening in omaha Okay. We were showing Night Owls at this theater. There's an independent theater there that's really awesome. Uh, it's part of this. Uh, this there's two. They have two theaters now called. It's Film Streams is the organization, and, and it was at the Ruth Sokolov Theater there, and they have another theater now as well, the Dundee that they've they've uh, taken over. It's really cool, awesome independent theaters in Omaha, and they were showing Night Owls there, and I flew in to introduced the screening and he was there for an event, and so I saw him. That was so that was probably four or five years ago now. Did he watch Night Owls? He did not. He made a joke about it. He's okay. like, I'm not staying for your movie. And he just walked out. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if he had any t- any feedback, but I guess not. No. <laughs> Still, great that you saw him. I mean, that, that's not that long ago. No, no. He remembered you and yeah. remembered your face and your cold, dead eyes. Yeah. You, yeah, okay. I Good. was lucky enough to visit the set of Sideways. Did I ever tell you that story? I don't know if you did. Where Where were they filming? Our friend, you know, Max Burke, he was my roommate yes. in college. He uh, he had, I believe it was his uncle who was working in the sound department on Sideways. And so he got me on set of Sideways. So Max and I went and talked to Payne and Payne came over and talked to me for a bit. I actually talked to Paul Giamatti for a little bit, too. It was really cool. Oh, nice. That's great. I, I don't know if I knew that, but yeah. now I do. Now you do. Now I do. <laughs> I don't know how to segue away from that story, Charles. So I'm just going to tell people. Well, I got, I got a great segue. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, you had to bring up Bruce Willis's penis again, didn't you? Y- yeah. You- oh, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wanted to know if it had a sound, you know? I Like, poor Leslie Ann Warren. I thought this would never happen again, but this is a this is a common thread now that you've brought up Bruce Willis's penis anytime you can on this show. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Why not? You know, it, the fact that we've we've talked to so many people who have worked on Color of Night is really something. Now so. we're gonna start. We just we should just make it a Color of Night podcast. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> At one point, some point, we'll be stuck doing this podcast when everyone associated with any Mission Impossible movie is dead or refuses to, to take our calls, and it will it'll just be a Color of Night podcast. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, <laughs> I apologize to anyone who did not want to hear. Whether or not Bruce Willis's penis had a specific sound effect <laughs> in Color of Night, he didn't. He said there wasn't one, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't believe there was. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. If you want more great content like this, you know where you can go, Charles. They can go to our Patreon. Yep. Do you want to try to sell this? Patreon is definitely where we get we get a little goofy sometimes. Yeah. We, we reviewed Tom Cruise's mask. You know, he has that yep. great mask that he uses. We did that. There's lots of fun stuff over there on the Patreon. Yeah. So sign up. There's a ton of different levels, a ton of different, you know, 
perks that you can get, including we have a monthly Skype chat that's a lot of fun. We do new episodes every week. We've done commentaries for all the movies. You know what we got to do now, Charles? I just thought of this. We got to do the Wick movies. We got to do commentaries for those. Oh, yeah. That's a great idea. We should do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Now, if you're uh, on the Patreon, you'll be able to get those yeah. when we get to them. <laughs> <laughs> Charles is having a child, so it might be a couple months, but we'll, we'll get to him. We'll get to him. Yes, yes, for sure. And you could go uh, get a t shirt or whatever uh, from T Public. We got a lot of great Mission Impossible designs on there. And, uh, you know, you can get to that on T Public or through our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. That's also where you'll see our show notes. And if you don't want to do any of that, you could just like, subscribe, rate, or review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And Charles, do you have some shout outs to give? Oh, I do, actually. Yes. I want to thank Jacob from Holland and Sonia Miranda for their help in making this podcast possible. They've both been with us for a while, and uh, they're both awesome contributors on our Skype chat as well. And uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to our intern, Abby Smith, who's such a big help, and to our mixer and editor, Luke Burson. They're great. You know what's great about our Patreon members is that they're also just awesome people. Yes. You know? So yeah, Sonia uh, is great, and I'm glad she's she's leveled up. And obviously, Jacob is a... I feel like he's our, our mascot for the show. <laughs> he is... He's been with us a long time now, and he's just kicking ass and taking names. We love Jacob yes. from Holland. He's so great. So, yeah, go there, and uh, we'll be back next week. Do we know who's who's next week, Charles? Next week, we've got the Editor's Roundtable that we were talking about in a previous episode. So it's oh. the, the editors of, of John Wick Chapter 3 will be with us. This is a really fun chat that we have. It'll go for two parts, and it's a, a really good one. You don't want to miss it. Oh, that that's awesome. That is a that is a master class in learning about film editing and just how movies of this scale work. And uh, can't wait for people to hear it. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. The doors to any service or provider in connection with the Continental are now closed. (laughs) 